Good. Uh, my name is Ryan Korstanch. I'm uh, a director of academic affairs at the Tennessee Higher Education Commission. Um, and welcome to OER 101. Lots of people are joining the meeting. Uh, let's start with a couple of logistics of uh, teams. So if you could just manage to keep yourself on mute. Um, we have a lot of people joining the meeting and we want to make sure that uh, we can get the information together efficiently and effectively uh, throughout the day. Uh, I'm joined by two presenters, Rachel Fleming and Elizabeth Spica, who are here uh, and um, just really expert in OER, both of them. Uh, I'm excited uh, for the presentation that we have today. Uh, it's more information than we have for 90 minutes. Um, so we'll we'll get through as much as we can. We'll take questions through the team's chat uh, and feel free to um, drop questions in there as you have them. We'll be monitoring the chat. Um, we will answer questions in the chat as we can. Um, and any questions that we're unable to answer um, during this presentation, uh, we'll come back and we'll distribute a document uh, with answers. Uh, both through the uh, Tennessee Open Education Hub at a link that I'll give you in just a second, and then also through um, uh, email to anyone whose email Teams has captured by logging in uh, here. Uh, so thank you all for joining us today. Um, let's get a couple of logistics of Teams, right? Again, uh, please make sure to stay on mute. Uh, also, if if it's OK with you, we'd love to have you mute your video just to address some bandwidth concerns and to make sure that everyone's able to uh, experience this webinar or this conference with as little video lag as is possible. Um, uh, we'll we'll hope that that uh, helps. I am told that it will. Uh, so anyway, uh, what we're going to do today is really three things. Um, we are going to give a big picture overview of OER, right? This is OER 101, uh, and so we're thinking just big picture overview, uh, and we're dividing that overview into three uh, components. Uh, first, what is OER? And I'm going to, that's my section, and I didn't really follow the instructions as a good, you know, uh, thinker. I didn't follow my own instructions. I'm going to bleed into why OER matters just a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk about licensing a little bit as well. Uh, that's what Elizabeth is going to talk to about, talk to us about. Uh, and then from there, we're going to get some kind of practical guide uh, from Rachel about how to approach the evaluation, creation, and sharing of OER materials. Uh, again, really excited about the content that we have for you today. Uh, one sort of final pre-factory matter. Um, I wanted to give uh, thanks, uh, give a thank you uh, to the TBR for helping with the logistics uh, of this event, um, including uh, specific thanks to Robert Dan and Lynn Drew, who've just been really uh, quite helpful behind the scenes in putting this all together. Um, so th thank you, Robert and Lynn. We appreciate your help. Uh, and finally, we wanted to specifically mention the TBR Cycle 3 uh, grant awardees and welcome them to this event. Uh, we hope that the information here is incredibly helpful as you begin your uh, OER development project. So with all of that uh, together, um, we can begin. Okay, with, so when they hire somebody. With the actual content. It ain't from here. Hang on so just that, a second. That, that, that argument falls flat. Very okay. Uh, right, so one reminder, if you wouldn't mind to keep yourself on mute and to also mute your video at this point, um, just to make sure that we're presenting a low bandwidth viewing option for as many people uh, so that they can view without great lag. Uh, that would be great. OK, so let's start uh, with um, more of the content part now that I've had all those uh, pre factory matters uh, taken care of. Um, I, I see several of you introducing yourself in the chat. Feel free to do that. That's always a fun way uh, to begin just to see uh, who's who's joining us from where. Um, OK, um, let's zoom out first, right? We're here to talk about some specific details of using and creating OER. 
Uh, and let's start by zooming out. And I, by zooming out, I want to think about some perspective or, or give us some perspective or have us agree to some perspective about why OER matters, right? So let me say, I understand entirely that many of you are already established OER users. Uh, you know this information. You've made specific pedagogical choices because of this information. Uh, and so in some ways, this won't be new information, but I do think that there's really good value in recentering ourselves and agreeing on the need for this uh, this process, this OER development thing. Uh, being reminded about why we're doing stuff can help us make sure that we're doing it for the right reasons. Uh, agreeing in a large group setting, you know, we have 150 people here, which is wild. Uh, agreeing in a large group setting about what's important uh, is also really, really helpful. Uh, so um, good. Uh, right. So some of the stats that we need to start with are stats that we know already. Uh, this is uh, a chart from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, and it demonstrates uh, consumer price index increases for tuition and school related items uh, from July 2011 to July 2021. Uh, so what we see here, I've highlighted three specific indexes. I've highlighted college tuition and fees, which is in uh, purple. I've highlighted housing costs at school, which is in this orangish color, and I've highlighted college textbook costs, which is in blue. So some of the talking points are ones that we know well, right? Tuition and incidental housing costs and the costs of attending college have increased. We know that. Uh, and that is part of um, the story that we need to be talking about today. The other part is textbook costs. Textbook costs have increased. That is undoubtedly true. Uh, but also an interesting part of the story is that since about 2018, uh, housing or not housing costs, textbook costs have plateaued uh, and even reduced a little bit since their peak or from their peak. And this is an interesting part of the uh, market analysis. Uh, certainly it's attributable to a lot of factors. Uh, one of the things that I would suggest is uh, the OER movement is impacting the cost of uh, course materials uh, in some direct ways, right? Reducing, eliminating textbook costs or instructional materials costs for students, but also in indirect ways as the existing textbook publishing market sort of changes uh, its strategies to um, reflect the change in the market that OER is providing. Uh, so uh, that's part of the context. College is more expensive. Instructional materials are more expensive. Um, in Tennessee, uh, this this graph comes off of our Tennessee Higher Education Factbook, the most recent factbook from 21-22. Uh, we see a similar rise. Uh, we have public universities here at the top, four-year universities, tuitions increase. Uh, and then we have our community college and technical college tuition increase. Tuition is increasing across the board. It's part of the modern day, whatever, 21st century college experience. We know that. Um, uh, and it's here in Tennessee as, as nationally. Uh, instructional materials present then significant barriers to students or the cost or the high cost of instructional materials present then in, uh, significant barriers to students. These barriers correlate to students receiving lower grades, students failing more courses, uh, students dropping and withdrawing from courses more frequently, uh, students choosing to avoid specific classes or programs. Uh, these are programs that have typically high uh, textbook costs either at specific classes or an entire program, right? We've all heard the story of STEM programs with four or $500 textbooks, right? That's what we're talking about there. And then we also see a reduced aggregate or total credit enrollment. Students are taking fewer courses per semester uh, because of the cost of instructional materials. Okay, we know these barriers. We've known these barriers for a long time, but part of the picture I think that needs to be, we need to be reminded of is that in the sort of context of increasing cost of college attendance, these barriers become more pronounced and more of a serious barrier, uh, especially for those students 
who are sort of um, in a socioeconomic status where college is not entirely um, guaranteed for them. Uh, so uh, ad addressing textbook costs or in the, the high cost of instructional materials becomes even more significant. We've always known that high cost instructional materials pose these barriers. It's even more pronounced now. Uh, and so it's something to pay more attention to. Uh, what I've done here is, and I know that this is uh, not super visually appealing, A, and B, uh, not super clear, but so what I've done here is uh, I pulled together a table of results of, uh, from several recent studies about uh, the effect of textbook costs on student choice. Uh, and so when you have, I'll, I'll share the link to these slides in a few minutes, but when you have uh, the link to the slides. These studies are all hyperlinked. You can go read them all on your own uh, as we get out, uh, as you go from here, if you haven't read them already. But I want to highlight a couple of things, right? So here are the several barriers or several of the barriers uh, that we notice attributed to high textbook costs. Uh, grades, failing a class, dropped or withdrawing from a class, avoiding classes, not purchasing materials, delaying the purchase of materials, or taking fewer courses. Uh, Look, I wanted to point out a couple of things, right? So these studies are all different populations at different times, different places, but there are some interesting parallels that we cannot miss. So according to the majority of these studies right here, two thirds of students are not purchasing required course materials. That's pretty significant and it's pretty important, right? What we need to remember, I think, students come to college to learn, uh, faculty select textbooks or course materials uh, to include in the class or to require of students because they believe in the best case possible, right? Because they believe those materials contribute to student learning uh, and assist students in their learning. Two thirds of students are regularly choosing not to purchase those course materials. That's a challenge, right? It's not just a challenge to course completion. It's not just a challenge to uh, course grades, although certainly with changes in the textbook market, not purchasing materials makes it more complicated to pass courses, right? And what I mean specifically there is uh, when you choose not to purchase an access code for a homework platform and the, the grades associated with your your uh, use of that homework platform attribute to some portion of your course grade, whatever it is, uh, not having that access code, not being able to complete that homework does contribute, does make it harder for you to have a good grade, can contribute to increased failure, uh, can make you want to drop or withdraw from a class, right? So all of that makes sense. Two thirds ish of students are choosing to not purchase books. Uh, when we look at delaying purchase, right, a lots of students are uh, selecting to wait and see if books are going to be actually used in class, right? That's also interesting. It's also significant. We talk a lot about day one access. Uh, that's a thing that we hear a lot from mainstream textbook publishers. Day one access to instructional materials is incredibly important to student success. If students don't have the books, it's going to be really difficult uh, for them to be successful in the class. Um, clearly, we know that. Uh, so these are some significant statistics uh, that, that, are, that are interesting and they're worth keeping in mind. So because of this, because of the rise of textbook costs, because we understand uh, the barriers, the rise of tuition as well, and because we understand the barriers that high cost instructional materials impose on students, uh, there have been several textbook affordability programs that have been established on campus, both in Tennessee and nationally. And I just wanted to focus on a couple that are happening here in Tennessee. Uh, and, and I'm focusing on several of these in the context of OER 101 to make a specific point that I'll make here in just a second. But what we've seen is uh, libraries are increasing their collections to include required course materials. These allow students right to check them out of the library and incur no cost. Uh, there's a program at the University of Memphis called the Bookstore Advanced Payment Program. This isn't this is a different kind of textbook affordability initiative, but it demonstrates the creativity of initiatives that are happening in this space. Uh, what we see is uh, when a student has more financial aid than their tuition costs, 
the, the the University of Memphis is sort of giving them a credit at the bookstore so they don't have to wait for a refund to purchase their required materials so they can make it a little simpler and easier to work through that process. Uh, Z degrees or ZTC degrees, zero textbook cost degree programs are very popular. In Tennessee, we have one at the University of, uh, or not at the University, at Model State Community College. Uh, what these programs do is they use a variety of mechanisms, OER, but also other free resources uh, to make an entire academic program that has no textbook costs associated with it. Open education resources, I'll say more about that in a minute. And then inclusive access. Inclusive access is essentially a contract buying program. Uh, it's in use all over uh, all over the place. It's very popular. Uh, it's directly some textbook costs are directly billed to students. Uh, it goes right into their tuition bill. It allows them to have day one access. Uh, but it's important to recognize that this is limited term expiring access to course materials, usually for the period of around three months or one semester, right? So those are a variety of textbook affordability programs. The point that I want to make here, and this is something that I think uh, is going to come back up several times, but the point to, to focus on here is that open educational resources are one of many textbook affordability programs. Uh, open educational resources do reduce the cost to students when we think about instructional materials, right? They reduce, they eliminate the cost to students. It's not the only textbook affordability program in the landscape of affordability programs. It's not the only affordability program that's happening in Tennessee, uh, but open educational resources are a specific type of textbook affordability program, right? And certainly, and this is where I want to move next. Uh, yeah, not the only, but the best. Uh, yes, I agree, Elizabeth. Um, this is where I want to move next, right? Free is only a part of what makes OER great and important, right? Uh, we're, and we'll talk some more about that through the through the rest of this presentation, right? Free is a big part of open education resources. It's not the only part of open educational resources. So let's start with a definition of what open educational resources are. Uh, this is uh, from Creative Commons. It's not the only definition, uh, but it's a common one, and so it's the place that I wanted to start with. Um, open edge. I'm going to just read it, and then I know it's weird to read a slide, but it's going to happen. So here we go. The open educational resources are teaching, learning, and research materials that are either a in the public domain or b licensed in a manner that provides everyone with free and per perpetual permission to engage in the five R activities. I wanted to highlight three or four points out of this definition because I think that this is really critical, especially when we read this against the conversation about increasing cost and the conversation about reducing those barriers that are associated with high cost textbook materials, right? Free is a part of OER. It's not the only part of OER. And I know I've said that, but I want to emphasize that a couple of times because I think it's really important and it's easy to misunderstand. Uh, so, there are a couple of right key features of this definition. First is here, uh, OER are teaching, learning, and resource materials. This means that OER are not just textbooks. It's really easy to think about OER textbooks because of how popular OpenStax books are, right? Uh, in the same, but the, but let me let me frame this carefully. The instructional materials, the way that classes are being instructed, the way that tech classes are taught have changed. It's not just that classes are designed around textbooks anymore. Post-secondary classes are taught in a variety of ways and they incorporate a number of different materials, some of which are textbooks, right? But not all of them are. Open education resources is a broad term that allows for the incorporation of many of these different materials into the, into the conversation. Second thing is, that this definition says something specific about licensing. OK, and this is critical uh, in our understanding of open education resources. We're actually going to spend the next half hour of our presentation talking about licensing. Elizabeth's going to lead us in that conversation uh, here in just a minute. So I'm not going to steal her expertise or her punches, but please understand that licensing is an important part of uh, OER. Uh, and then free, we mentioned that already, free is part of the OER landscape and what makes OER OER and what makes OER great. 
Uh, and then the last part that I wanted to mention here is perpetual permission or perpetual access. Uh, perpet perpetual access is an incredibly important part of this OER uh, landscape. Uh, it's expressed actually through this thing that we call the five R's. And so I'm going to, instead of talk about that here, I'm going to talk about it with regard to the five R's, right? So when materials are licensed as an open educational resource, uh, five permissions are granted to users, right? They're the permission to retain or keep copies and control how those copies function, right? Uh, so that's the first. There, it's the permission to reuse the materials, right? So you can use it in class, but you don't have to use it just in class. You can take it to a study group. You can put it on a website, right? You can reuse the open educational resource. You can revise. Uh, and interesting, I know that several of you are fami familiar with open educational practices. These last three of the R's give us a foundation for open educational practices, uh, which we're not going to have a lot of time to talk about today, but we can revise. That means we can adjust or modify or alter the content. If I'm thinking about it from back when I was a faculty member, OER gives me the, the permission or the possibility to create my own customized edition of uh, in, of instructional materials the way that I want to create it, right? It also allows me to remix. I can combine rather than selecting one chapter or another, rather than uh, assigning students two resources, I can combine them, I can put them together, I can put them together with my own content, right? So long as I attribute everything correctly, uh, to cr I can create a new material out of existing materials, and then I can redistribute materials. I can share it. Right, so these form the core, in my opinion, of what makes OER great, in addition to the fact that it's freely available to, to end users. OK, types of OER. I mentioned earlier that OER is not just textbooks, uh, and I did want to focus on that. The other thing that I wanted to say is OER is not just digital. Print versions can be OER as well, because again, this, this relates to how materials are licensed in as much as it relates to their cost, right? Uh, those are overlapping components of the definition. Uh, so various multimedia, videos, images, podcasts, instructor resources, lecture notes, slides, lesson plans, assessment resources, test quizzes, on through. Courses, there are, in, there are whole courses that are licensed as OER, right? Which means that each of those five R's activities that I talked about on the previous slide can be applied to an individual course. Uh, there are also publications, textbooks, journals, books, theses, dissertations, and then data sets. Uh, and I don't have examples of different types of data sets that moves outside of my expertise. Uh, but if you're interested, I can provide you with a list of places to find uh, open educational resources that are data sets. Uh, right, not textbooks, instructional materials. OER is a broad category of things. Um, OK, why does it matter? I think that OER contributes significant value to students, to instructors, and to institutions. OK, so for students, OER allows students to save money. That's in, in and that in the context that we were talking about earlier is an important value. It allows students immediate and continuous access to materials. This means that they can have materials on the first day of class. It also means that they can keep materials for as long as they want to keep them and they can refer back to those materials uh later if it's in a class that follows in sequence if it's in their career right the materials are theirs to retain uh it eliminates time uh the use of oer eliminates time for textbook sourcing students don't have to, students are spending an increasing amount of time finding the best place to get textbooks or instructional materials at affordable costs up to 20, 30, 40 hours at the start of the semester when really their time would be better spent figuring out how to learn and how to navigate their classes, right? Uh, the use of OER eliminates that time. Uh, it allows students to complete more courses because it removes that financial barrier associated uh, with the cost of instructional materials and because uh, it allows them to learn in a different context and more effectively. It's associated with higher grades and it gives them a quicker time to graduation because they can take more classes at a time uh, because the, the cost of individual courses is reduced. Uh, to instructors, I taught for a decade. I taught using OER. This, this comes right out of my experience uh, teaching. Students have immediate and continuous access, right? 
And it's also access that I control and I understand, right? I don't have to spend tons and tons of time figuring out how to help students navigate a new platform. I don't have to figure out how to get them access to materials. They have access to materials. That is a distinct value. Um, I can engage in in-process customization. I can revise and remix OER during the semester. That's interesting. It provides pedagogical flexibility. I can teach in different ways because of OER. Uh, it correlates to increased student satisfaction, right? Just at the outset, uh, when I tell students, or when I told students when I was in the classroom, when I told them, hey, free textbook, right? We're using a textbook that's free. It bought, they, they were happy right from the beginning. It bought me some credibility with them as an instructor. Uh, and then it gives different design opportunities. I'm not bound to the traditional confines of what textbooks are or what instructional materials have been. Uh, next and last for me, uh, there's a value of OER to institutions. Uh, Lumen has an interesting calculator to sort of suss out the ROI uh, of OER adoptions, and they base this on a bunch of research. Uh, if you're interested in that, I'll put a link to that in the chat as I can as I can later on. Uh, but OER removes barriers to student entry, right? And it makes a campus more student friendly. It removes barriers to student retention. It's it's less complicated and less co less costly for students to re-enroll in, in a following year. Uh, it increases student satisfaction. We talked about that earlier. It increases course throughput rate, which means students are taking and completing more courses. It's correlate, correlated to increased credit production, and it's correlated with increased revenue production, right? These are distinct advantages. Um, saying nothing of increased student learning, which is more complicated uh, to measure. Uh, so anyhow, uh, that is sort of an overview of what OER is uh, and why it matters. And I'm going to pass things off now to Elizabeth, who's going to uh, tell us a little bit more about licensing. Sounds good. And thank you, Ryan, for for that and for driving the uh, presentation bus. I'll just say next slide if that works and we'll advance like that. So. Um, Hello everyone, um, I'm Elizabeth Spica. I'm a Creative Commons Global Network member, and I'm currently serving as a legal fellow with the Wikimedia Foundation, primarily on their trademark enforcement team, um, just kind of helping keep the wheel going so that we can all, as they say in Wikipedia and Wikimedia, imagine a world where the some of all knowledge is freely shared. So um, it's good to see your names at least. I recognize so many of these names and I just wanted to quickly say congratulations and thank you. Thanks a million because you may think, you know, you're, you're making a drop in the pond, but it's going to have this huge ripple effect far beyond what you even know now. So thank you very much. Um, in the next couple of minutes, I want to talk about um, what content you can use as you start your, your hunt for your OER textbook resources, what content you can use, how you should attribute and give credit to the creators of those sources, and then also introduce a few tools that I think are gonna come in really handy um, as you progress through this process. But before we dive in, I think it's important to say a word about like what is Creative Commons and where did it come from? Basically, Creative Commons is a global nonprofit organization, and it was founded by Stanford law professor Larry Lessig or Lawrence Lessig. I don't know him. I can't call him Larry, right? But that's the guy that um, is here on the slide. It was founded by him and a gentleman by the name of Eric Eldred, who was a computer programmer, and he was a literacy advocate, much like us, um, and he made his living, or he made a, a career out of taking works that had entered the public domain and putting them on the internet. So think back to 1999, internet was hopping. It was like a new thing. And so this organization they created in reaction to what's called the Copyright Term Extension Act of 1998 which basically extended the copyright term from the life of the author plus 50 years to the life of the author plus 70 years. So as Eric Eldred is getting ready to put all these things freely available online, suddenly he can't do that anymore. 
And um, as an aside, sometimes this is referred to as the Mickey Mouse Copyright Term Extension Act, because imagine 1998 was the year when the Steamboat Willie character from Disney was set to come into the public domain. If that, uh, putting those two and two together, uh, what forces were behind the Copyright Term Extension Act, but that's another presentation, right? So they founded this as a way to work within copyright because these are licenses just like copyright but to allow authors to get credit for their creations, but also give permissions to other people to use and share their work. And go ahead, next slide, Ryan, thank you. So these six licenses made up of those four symbols, let creators, anybody, go outside the normal traditionally copyrighted uh, world and assign permissions and communicate to others, yes, you can use this, and here are the things that you can do with it. What's common to all these is the buy. You can see the CC buy symbol. Common across all of this is you can use it, but you have to give credit to the creator. That's the basis of the license. The most free is CC buy, and then you get down to some different, um, different restrictions or different permissions. So just as a quick um, reminder, and for those who aren't familiar, the SA, so I'm on the top row going over to the CC by SA, means share alike. And that tells you, you can take that content, that material, you can use it, but you have to license whatever you create under that same license. So if it's CC by share alike, whatever you create out of it, even when you add in your own material, you have to license it CC by share alike. And then that's combined in a few ways down at the bottom over on the left side, CC by NC for non-commercial share alike. If you come across content like that, yes, you can use it, but ultimately what you create um, needs to be licensed in that same way. So the other permission is the non-commercial permission there um, that I just mentioned. It means that the work is to be available for non-commercial purposes. I don't think you should be scared of that, but um, I will talk about that in just a second. Um, the ND, I left that one out. So going down to the middle row, over to the left, you see CC by ND, and then down below that, the most restrictive CC by non-commercial, no derivatives. It means yes, you can use it, but you have to use it exactly like that and you can't change it. You can't change a word of it. Doesn't mean you can't use it, but you have to give credit to the author and you have to use it exactly as, as they have. So um, go ahead to the uh, next slide, please. So let's get uh, right into it. What kind of content can we use? And I'm gonna talk about what content we can use, um, how you give credit to it, and then also, I'm not going to be able to read this. Um, I'm going to read this. I want to read this chat, but I'll get to that. I think we'll have some time at the end. So what content can you use? Here it is. Public domain material. Openly licensed Creative Commons resources, and we just looked at those licenses. Your original work, which as part of this grant, you're going to license CC BY, so it can be mixed with anything. Copyrighted work that you obtain permission to use and copyrighted work under fair use or any combination of the above. So I will talk about copyrighted work um, a little bit more because I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions is that, ooh, you know, I can't I can't use any copyrighted work. Where am I going to find openly licensed material for every single thing that I need? Well, you don't have to. And I'll talk about that. Next slide. Starting with the public domain, I think we're all familiar being in education. These materials are pretty much either based on age or because the creator of that work has licensed it in the public domain. So as of right now, anything that was created in the United States before January 1st, 1927 are, is now part of the public domain. So you'll often see these works um, indicated with these two symbols. Basically, the one on the top is when someone creates something and then they license it immediately into the public domain. The one on the bottom is a symbol that you'll often see associated with, um, and yes, I will, Charles, um, is often what you see associated with museums where they're just marking older things just to signal to other people that they're in the public domain. Sometimes you won't see anything at all, and based on its age, you'll be able to um, assume that it's part of the public domain, more or less. Next slide. And it's not just old stuff. 
that is part of the public domain. I wanted to share this really cool icon collection from the Noun Project. I used these public domain icons to redo a website for um, the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies at UT. How cool are these? So don't think that it's just like old literary things that are in the public domain. There's a lot of there's a lot of really great stuff that's even modern. Next slide. So let's hop into the Creative Commons licensed stuff. And Rachel's going to show you um, so many troves and places to find the material. So I'm not going to talk about that, but I am going to share a few tools that will help you understand how to attribute those sources and how they can work together. Next slide. As I mentioned, CC BY is the standard because it plays so well with everything else. You can mix it. You can mingle it, you can go to town with it. Um, CC BY is the ultimate. Anytime you can find this and you have a choice of this and another license, this is what you want. Next slide. As I mentioned, the non-commercial use can sometimes cause confusion. I put the definition of non-commercial there on the slide. And a lot of people want to use this, this uh, license because you know you don't want a publisher or someone else exploiting your work, right? You worked hard to put it down. And you don't want someone taking and running with it and making money off of it. That is understandable. I totally get that. Um, however, down the line, um, it, it can cause some problems downstream. So if you have a choice between the non-commercial stuff and CC BY stuff, you will pick CC BY every day of the week. And I respect if you create something and you want to license it non-commercial. Um, in the end, I think it's a wash and I think you should just license your stuff CC BY because it helps everyone, yourself included. So um, next slide. One last comment about uh, these no derivative licenses. This is a scale that shows the most open, which you guessed it, CC BY is at the top, to the most restrictive licenses. Some people in the open education community consider these no derivative licenses not to be OER technically because they restrict you from some of those 5R permissions that Ryan mentioned, like revising and remixing it with other content. Um, you know, whatever. If you find this stuff and it's really good, use it. Don't be scared of it. Just know that you've got to use the entire chunk as it was and you can't change anything about it, but it's still open. OK, next slide. And then a nod to copyright material now. Let's go to the next slide. Yes, you can use traditionally copyrighted material. Anytime you can avoid it, I would do that. Um, you can use it if you have permission in writing. And on the resource guide that we'll be providing, there's a really great template where you can reach out to people to request permission. So if you absolutely must have something, consider writing the author for permission. Get the permission in writing, file that away, and then you can use it. You can also use the content under fair use. So fair use, the best analogy that I have for this is the research paper. We've all been in academia. We know this. That fair use is the doctrine upon which our ability to do scholarship exists. We take other people's quotes, we take other people's ideas, and we create a paper that we have our own thought. So everything in fair use hinges upon is your use transformative. When you think about the research paper, you've got your thesis idea, and then you take from all these other sources to support your idea, which is new. That is a transformative use. I'm not going to go through all of these things, but I do want you to see that courts, if there ever is an infringement issue, this is the process that a court will follow. They look at a number of things. Are you using it to try to make money off of it? Are you stealing money from somewhere from someone else? Are you using a lot of it or a little bit? Is it educational? They look at everything because there is no clear answer. If someone told you, well, you got to use, you know, if it's 5% or less, uh, -uh you know, because that 5% or less could be considered the nucleus of the most substantial thing about that work, in which case, yeah, you know, probably shouldn't have done that, right? So I'm saying this because Courts consider a lot of things. It is not clear, but for you, you've been intuitively doing this um, pretty much your entire life as an academic. Fair use, think about the research paper and would you get your student for plagiarism based upon the amount that they've copied and pasted and how they're using that material? If so, I wouldn't use it in your own OER, but you can 
absolutely use copyrighted material under fair use. So if you're in doubt, get permission, find something else, which is always even more ideal, or link. And let's go to the next slide to talk about that. So linking to a website doesn't require permission from the copyright holder, and it's not considered copyright infringement. So um, let's say, you know, when, when Biden was inaugurated, Amanda Gorman read that delightful poem, The Hill We Climb. It's everywhere on the internet, right? Um, can you take that and copy paste it and put it in your OER textbook? No, you cannot because Amanda Gorman is the copyright holder of that. And unless she's given you permission, um, you cannot do that. But what you can do is link to a website, um, to link to her website or some other source where people can read her poem. So linking, no problem. Um, I would say if you are going to use links, don't just put a link, you know, put a nice descriptor, you know, and talk about how you're using that. Amanda Gorman's poem is a great example of X literary style, see it here, colon, and then put the link. So linking, totally okay. And of course, even on that page, you should just go ahead and provide proper attribution because that's what we do, right, um, as, as academics. All right, next slide. Speaking of attribution, let's talk about how you give credit. It's a simple formula. Some of this stuff gets way too complicated. This is very simple. Next slide. As a quick reminder, or this is something that I didn't know until I was deep in Creative Commons. So there, the difference between licensing, attribution, and citation. So licensing is what you do to things that you create. You license them. You either license them openly. If you don't license them at all, then they're automatically traditionally copyrighted here in the United States. Attribution is what you're going to do to all of these open sources. You're going to be giving authors credit. Citation is the credit that you give to traditionally copyrighted works. How about graphics with citation? Is it fair use? I think it depends. The, the legal answer is always it depends, right? But we'll look at uh, a few things. It depends on how you're using it. But if you're using it in the context of proving a point, possibly. However, I don't think that any of us should be using a graphic that is traditionally copyrighted with the treasure trove of images that Rachel will show you um, that are already openly licensed. No reason to use anything that's copyrighted. Openly licensed images exist and it's great. So, all right, next slide. So here's the formula. Title, author, source, license. Tassel. So title, what's it called? Even if it's called unnamed photo, you know, give it a title. The author or creator. The source. Where did you find it? And if you can hyperlink that, that's awesome. And then the license. And each of these licenses will link to the appropriate Creative Commons license page. Why would you do this? And I'll show you a tool that will make this easy. You're doing this because this creates metadata that helps this entire ecosystem flourish because those connectors and all of these links leading back out to that license page is part of what feeds our ability to um, find and have all of these things be connected. So anywhere you can have a link in your attribution, you should do so. Next slide. Here's a just kind of diving right in. You're going to have your work as a whole that you all do, and this is the license that you're going to give it. Your entire textbook will be licensed except where otherwise indicated. This work, and then you'll put your textbook title and then the link to the Tennessee Open Education Hub, and you'll put your names by X, Y, and Z, is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 International License, and that links to the Creative Commons page. Now, there's also shortened version, and I'm going to show you a few examples just so you can see that it's not so strict if you miss a word here or there. There's some variation as long as you have these elements you're OK, yeah, but we are putting except where otherwise indicated. Why? Because we are finding all different kinds of licensed things and not everything will be CC by 4.0 and where it's not, you will be indicating such ideally at the footnote of each page or the best practice is to have the attribution as close to the place where it occurs as possible. So this is your blanket license. Let's let's dig into some images. Next slide, Ryan. So here's an example of an image, and I pulled this from the Creative Commons site. You can see the same elements. 
you have the Fergellan Afterglow title by Lucas, the author, and I'm pretty sure that links to his website, which is bonus, right? Um, is licensed under CC by ND 2.0, and then that links to Creative Commons. This is fun. Um, you might be asking, where's the source? My guess is that the Fergellan Afterglow, when you click on it, it's going to take you um, to the page where um, this person found it. So all those elements. Next slide. Here's just a few other ideas about how you can do it. You can see if you're going to be in a non hyperlink kind of area, you can also just spell out the place where it's located. And a lot of times, like when you are looking for photos, they might have a strange name. You know, it's not going to be John Price. It's going to be like um, Big Red Dog, you know? Well, then you just put by Big Red Dog. You put whatever um, you've been able to find and what information you have. Patrick is a good uh, question. Do you need to worry about the differences between CC 2.0 and 4.0? Overall, no, not for these particular uses. There are some, some minor differences, but they are negligible in the context of creating educational resources that are non-commercial and you know being used in this specific context. The great thing about Creative Commons too is that um, as a community, if you make a mistake, it's not like you're gonna have the hammer of the law down on you. The, the rule, especially as was introduced with 4.0, is to contact that person who has it infringed and give them 30 days to correct it and no harm, no foul. So this is a different type of playing field um, for all intents and purposes. All right, next slide. Let's see, um, here's yet another example. I'm sure everyone's been to the Lumen Learning website and seen down at the bottom, they have a section for licenses and attributions. They're doing the same thing. You can see title, author, source, and license. So all those elements are there. Don't worry too much about it. If you did you know, the exact right thing, just put those elements in and you're gonna be okay. All right, next. Okay, this is my favorite tool. Go ahead and bookmark this one now. It's the license chooser. So um, when you find stuff, you'll find a lot of stuff. You can fill out this tool and it will give you that nice copy paste code down in the bottom right hand corner. So you can just copy paste either the, uh, the image, you can copy paste the text, or if you're working on a website, there's code there that you can copy paste. So I run everything through this. It will ask you a few questions, and if you see that something CC by share alike, you can, you know, put those things in there, and it will automatically populate over on the right side what license it is. Uh, and thank you, Diane. Um, and then gives you the copy paste there. Use this, you know, let it do the work for you. Okay, next slide. Are you going to keep it all straight? Rachel's going to talk to you about this, but you should really start using this yesterday. Um, anytime you find something that you want to use, go ahead and put the resource in a course map, and we're going to give you a link to this too. Um, put the link where you found it, put kind of an idea about where you want it, write what license it is, because you will definitely forget. Oh, you're going to forget. You're going to wish that you had done this. So uh, start collecting this in a Google document or something um, now. All right, next slide. So let's dive into. Remixing and adapting, which is the, the great part um, about OER. Next slide. So remixing and adaptations are like a smoothie. You know, we got the pineapple, you got the orange, you got the apple, and they're all separate little things, right? But then when you put them in the blender and you blend them up, there's a new thing and you can't really tell where the pineapple stopped and the apple started, et cetera. This in the OER world is a remix. So um, however, as we learned with the no derivatives, right, only certain things can be remixed. So there's a tool to help you with that. Next slide. This is the um, CC license compatibility chart. So as you are looking, and for example, um, I'm as part of a project with uh, Wikimedia, I'm trying to create an open trademark enforcement textbook. So I've got the intro chapter. And gotta love an intro chapter because there's always like so much you know, material for an intro chapter. So I've got uh, 
CC by stuff, like three different things that are CC by, and then I'm writing my own stuff. And I can tell by looking at this chart, I'm going to find the CC by on the vertical column. And the material I found is also CC by. So I'm going to find that on the horizontal column. And you see the green check mark. That means you can mix it. You can go to town. I can take one sentence from one, one from the other, add my own. It's no problem. I can take half a sentence from one, put a few words of my own, and then the rest of the sentence from something else. That's remixing. And that's what's really cool about this is because it allows you to create the perfect solution for the course and align it with your learning outcomes. So there's just not a bunch of extra stuff that you're not ever going to use or tend to, and it overwhelms your students, right? So CC BY stuff can be mixed. Let's say that I have found a CC BY. I have all those three CC BY things. I've written my own things, but then there is a CC BY ND. I come across it, so I'm going to use the chart. I cannot mix these things. I can put the CC BY ND stuff separate, like as a as one section, and then you put the attribution down at the bottom, and then I will start a separate section where I can properly mix these things. So use this as you're trying to figure out when you guys find material, can you mix them together? That's what this is for. Um, next slide. And then the last tool that I really wanted to uh, show you is just kind of reflective of the other tool that we just looked at in terms of can things be mixed? So Wikipedia, as everybody uses, and it's awesome, and I encourage you to um, try to find ways to incorporate that into your uh, classes wherever possible because it just helps the world, right? Um, Wikipedia material is CC by SA. So I'm going down here. This helps you determine if you're remixing something and you're playing with these different licenses. What license should you put on the things that you're remixing? Um, to take a step back, this is going to be a little less relevant for your textbook as a whole because we looked at you have your blanket license unless otherwise indicated, and you are going to indicate every place where it's not CC BY, right? But let's say you have a worksheet that you're creating and you found a CC BY ND that's awesome. You just have to have it, right? Um, and you want to add in some things. So by looking at that, you can see that when you use that, let's see, CC by ND, you cannot mix them. So you're going to have your worksheet with the CC by ND stuff in your intro separately. And then I would attribute both of those things down at the bottom. What I wanted to say was when you have CC by SA, like you're working with Wikipedia, and then you add in your own stuff as CC BY. The only license is CC BY SA. I'm sorry if this sounds confusing um, because it is confusing when you first look at it. The bottom line is whatever the most restrictive license is of the stuff that you're using, if you are creating something new that's standalone, like a worksheet, or let's say you take your chapters and you isolate them out of the textbook and you want to put that out as a separate standalone item. You have to use the most restrictive license of everything that you found. And that's another reason why if you can avoid CC by ND or CC by non-commercial, even the share alike stuff, um, it's just going to make life easier if you end up in situations where you have different standalone products, if that makes sense. So like public domain material, if you're using that, you have some of that, and then you add in some of your own stuff. You can license that any any one of those. So it's green all the way across. Public domain material can be licensed in any way. If you have CC BY stuff, you can use any license for your new product that you want except for public domain. Why? Because public domain, you don't even have to give permission. With Creative Commons licenses, the foundation is permission and giving credit to authors. So you can't license CC BY stuff that you've combined and add it in as public domain, uh -uh. you have to pick one of these. So let's say that you have CC BY and C. You cannot license it CC BY. And well, these are yellow because technically maybe there are some situations where you, you should, but don't mess with the yellow, stick with the green. So if you have CC BY and C, you mix in your own stuff, you must license that either CC BY and C, CC BY and C, ND, 
or CC by NCSA. And if your head hasn't exploded yet, then um, mine certainly has. So Diana, the, the green and yellow, green means go. That means that you can apply any of these licenses on the horizontal access access if you're using material here. And we can put some more um, instructions in the guide. This is the least relevant tool because really on the overview level, you have your textbook, it has a blanket license and you are indicating anywhere else where you're walking outside of that CC by boundary. So except where otherwise indicated, this OER textbook is licensed CC by. So again, this adapter's license chart, put it in the back pocket just so you know it exists. It really applies if you're doing standalone things and uh, creating new things outside of this particular project, if that makes sense. Um, next slide, I wanna wrap up here. Right, yes. So the recap, some of the things that you'll have um, before I pass it over to Rachel. Um, you have librarians, can I say that? And Rachel Fleming's one of my favorite librarians, but if you have questions about this stuff, librarians, part of their training is uh, extensively in fair use, more than um, more than I think we academics you know, have had um, ourselves, um, but librarians are a great resource to talk about fair use. They're a great resource likely to help you walk through some of these um, tools and use some of these tools. So when you get your resource packet, you'll have course map, you'll have the license chooser. My favorite tool makes it copy paste easy. You'll have the compatibility chart, which you will use most often to tell what can I mix together and um, what is mixable, what do I need to leave alone um, as you're walking through this process. You'll also have the adapter's license chart that helps you apply the right license if you're creating something that is considered you know, to be a different new product. And then fair use considerations, I think Rachel may talk a little bit more about those. So uh, thank you all so much uh, and congratulations and thanks again. And I'm, I'm so pleased uh, to be here and I'll pass it to Rachel now, thank you. Trying to turn my camera on. There we go. Um, hello, we're in the home stretch now. Um, I am Rachel Fleming. I'm scholarly communications librarian at the University of Tennessee Chattanooga. And um, they've invited me a librarian and promised you that I will give you practical advice. I am not going to promise to give you practical advice. I am going to promise to tell you about a lot of resources, more resources than you thought a person could tell you about in 30 minutes. And uh, I'm going to apologize for that at the outset. Um, so among my various duties at UTC, uh, the most important and exciting ones are the ones related to our affordable course materials initiative, supporting faculty doing course revision projects and supporting faculty who have done um, creation of OER. Um, so I'm excited to wrap up today with tips for finding, evaluating, incorporating and creating OER, and hopefully uh, you will find yourselves equipped with tools and inspiration um, both to get started on your project and don't worry there will be a guide with a ton of links um, so don't feel like you have to take notes on everything um, I want to thank Elizabeth for shouting out librarians and I'm going to start out by shouting out uh, course designers and your center for teaching and learning um, uh, and I want to say I come from uh, kind of a project management mindset approaching OER project and again, I cannot stress enough the importance of planning at the outset of a project. It's gonna save you so much time as you go along. Um, use those course maps, like we said, um, to help um, scope out your project, kind of both as getting a lay of the land and to create some boundaries around your project so you can keep it um, to being a, a, an attainable goal. And the planning stage is also this great opportunity to take some time to think and rethink about your course. Um, OER um, like leader uh, Robin DeRosa has said that, you know, adopting and adapting OER is this great opportunity to put your course first, to have your pedagogy drive your course materials instead of letting your textbook drive how you design the course. So you want to take this opportunity to take ownership of 
the entire project and hopefully share some of that ownership with your students. Um, and you have so many great resources um, to support you in course design. Um, I'm again, I encourage you to connect with your centers for teaching and learning or explore the links in the resource guide and the many great websites that are out there. Um, you might be familiar with quality, the Quality Matters rubric for online course design or the Universal Design for Learning Framework, both of which use um, backwards design um, to get to their goals. And course mapping is, a, again, a tool that's used in backwards design. So while you're using a course map to help track um, all of the resources you're going to incorporate in your course, you can also, again, use it to track your, your course outcomes, your assessments, and your assignments as well. So you're going to have the, the biggest spreadsheet of all time, which is really exciting to me. Um, and you also want to think about what kind of high impact practices you can be um, br bringing into your class. Um, you know, those are the, the definition of those of uh, instructional methods that have been shown to have significant educational benefits. Uh, we think about things like collaborative assignments, um, service learning, and things like that. And um, slide, I also want to um, encourage you to, to bring in open pedagogy into that discussion. Um, I'm not going to read this, but I am going to say uh, you can find a really great introduction to open pedagogy in um, the open textbook or the open book, a guide to making open textbooks with students, which also has a bunch of um, really great case studies about working with students to make materials. Um, open pedagogy is I I love it so much and we could talk about it for 90 minutes. Um, it uses open technology to engage students as co-creators of the learning environment, and it creates just such a remarkable level of student engagement. And it can be something as simple as co-creating attendance policies um, with your students or something in, as in-depth as creating an OER together with your students. Um, so yeah, I recommend uh, taking a look at some of the assignments that are highlighted in this textbook. And I have a couple of uh, examples from projects that folks have done at UTC on the next slide, because it can be kind of hard to imagine what, what this might be. Um, um, on the right hand side. Um, we have a exhibition guide that students made um, describing some of these um, pre-Columbian artifacts that are in our University of Tennessee Chattanooga special collections um, that none of us librarians here had the expertise to describe, but our art students did. Um, and then that is freely available and being used around the world. One of my favorite things is also a couple of primary source instructional materials lesson plans which our students did and instead of creating a lesson plan and turning it in, they created a lesson plan and then shared it online with open license so that it's available for all of our local teachers to use as well. Um, projects like having students develop multiple choice questions to expand test banks is really accessible to students at all levels and is really highly engaging. Um, so um, I'm sure that you all have uh, additional examples that I would love to hear about at another time. Uh, so uh, we'll be moving along to uh, also mention that planning is a great time to develop strategies to ensure that your course and your resources are as inclusive and accessible as possible. I'm going to talk about um, a couple of resources to help you with that later on. But again, uh, every every minute you spend planning is going to save you a lot of work later on, um, especially with accessibility and inclusion. So no matter what kind of project you're working on, I, I encourage you to do a really thorough search for open materials that already exist. So you could be adapting the uh, adopting these um, as they are, um, adapting them to your specific purpose or using them as part of a remix. Um, what's important is that we want to be sharing the labor in our open community and avoiding constantly reinventing the wheel. If somebody has done it, even as Elizabeth mentioned, half of a sentence. I don't have to write that half of a sentence and that's saved me a lot of effort. Um, if it's appropriately licensed, it's there for you to use. So now I'm going to start my regaling you with so many places to look. Um, so when I start thinking about um, OER projects, I start with what I call uh, book shaped OER, uh, open textbooks. And um, the first place that we all think of is OpenStax. Um, next slide. And I wanted to mention OpenStax. You probably know them and recognize their um, distinctive uh, branding. 
um, I wanted to mention their books because not only do they create these, um, the suite of introductory level textbooks, um, but they've also, especially since the quarantine period, devoted a lot of energy to um, providing a suite of uh, surrounding materials. Um, they have not only the text textbook and the test bank, but also slides, course cartridges that you can just you know plug into your learning management system, and it's got all the links that you want, so you don't need to. Um, make it yourself. Um, and now they've got some easy to download files that can help you uh, use their text in a remix or an adaptation. As all, they also have um, links to communities where other adopters can share their um, individual assignments or other materials that they've used in their class. So it's a whole community around the book. Um, and I mean, when you look at the numbers of folks who have adopted OpenStax books, it's, it's really mind blowing to me. Um, it's more than you think. Um, the next place that I'll go is the Open Textbook Library, uh, which is a curated collection of over a thousand textbooks now um, hosted by the Open Education Network, which is uh, based out of the University of Minnesota and is um, organized very well. You can browse by subject or search by keywords. And in addition to um, being able to look through these uh, 1,082 as of the time I made this slide, um, the books, they often have really thorough reviews from other faculty members that can be he helpful in determining whether that book is gonna be uh, useful for your purposes. And the final place I go to look for textbook shaped OER is uh, the Pressbooks directory, which allows you to search across all texts which use the Pressbooks publishing platform. Searching here is kind of a mixed bag um, because I do find um, things that I don't come across in other uh, places, but I'll oft often also um, come across several different adaptations of the same text, which can be a, a little frustrating. So um, you do find things, um, but, but it can be frustrating. Uh, one of my colleagues says, um, Librarians are the only ones who like to search. Everyone else likes to find. Um, so I, I think I'm probably uh, exhibiting that right now. Um, but we all know that textbooks aren't the only OER. Um, so we can move along to some places to look for other types of OER. Um, firstly, the Tennessee Open Education Hub, which you'll become more and more familiar with. Um, we've got in the hub, search hub resources which um, is a curated set of oer and in the tennessee collection um, the work of previous grant recipients and other tennessee colleagues so that's really a, a kind of a subset of a much larger um, network the oer commons which is in the next slide their home page um, the oer commons is my first stop when I'm searching for a, a really broad range of OER materials, you can see right away I've got a kind of a Google style. What are you looking for? But also an ability to limit by education level. Um, there's a lot of K-12 resources in here, but you can, you know, um, limit it to lower division college students. Um, and um, there's also additional limiting features in the search results. Um, that are very helpful. Um, if for some wild reason you limited me to two places to look for OER, it would be here in the OER Commons and the Open Textbook Library. Um, but I do have more for you <laughs> today. Um, I'm going to talk about accessibility a little bit later on, Thomas. Um, uh, I, yeah. Um, Merlot is a a place that has been housing OER uh, since before you knew about OER, since before I was in college, uh, um, since the 90s. Um, um, it is housed out of the California state system and it's you know been around forever. And I wanted to mention it because it's got one of my favorite little tools in the advanced search under ISBN. You can enter the ISBN of any book um publisher major publisher textbook any any kind of book you can enter that in the search and it will bring you back a selection of related oer 
which really will give you a head start if you don't know uh, where to look for um, associated materials. Uh, yeah, I don't want to leave out Merlot. They're pretty great. Um, uh, there's a final kind of tool that I wanted to mention for OER, um, which is a federated search tool. Um, these are searches that um, search several different um, databases and give you the results all together. Um, Oasis from SUNY Geneseo, which I'm still learning to pronounce um, years later, um, has this very friendly interface, which I adore, and um, easy to browse and easy to filter search results. You can limit by item type, um, subject source, and even by license type, which is very handy. Um, and you can see here on the front page that it's got public domain books and open access books. And you don't often find those in the OER focused search engine. So this can be uh, expand your search to some other material that you'll be able to use, um, but you you might not find in those other search. <laughs> there we go. Um, the other MetaFinder is a uh, Mason OER MetaFinder. I can't bring myself to call it mom. Um, it's not as shiny looking, but it's very powerful and it has um, a nice uh, advanced search in it. If you think I've um, talked to you about a lot of different searches, you can see right at the top um, the Mason MetaFinder searches across 21 resources and brings you those results. Um, Oasis has uh, at over 100 different places that it looks for OER. Um, it, it's really amazing. Um, I'm going to try and give a couple of search tips um, on this next slide. Um, as you might have gathered from my telling you about like nine um, places to look right away, my first tip is to cast a wide net. Um, you want to find as much material that might suit your needs as possible. And when you're searching, I really encourage you to use um, broad search terms, um, search on many sites, go to the second page. Um, Elizabeth is saying, oh, our search engines have come such a long way in the past five years but they're not a library catalog and they're not Google. Um, you're looking at the, the text that people have entered as descriptive text or full text searching. So you might need to use um, uh, synonyms to search for the same thing. You might not find something. Um, go ahead and click to the next page. I like to just like open 70 tabs and then um, once I've got that material, start narrowing it down. Um, and if you're stuck, um, Remember that you're not alone. We're a huge community. There's 150 of us here and um, you can ask us. Um, there's a listserv for the Community College Consortium listserv. The Tennessee Textbook Affordability listserv is available um, and your own social networks and your own interpersonal networks are available. Uh, talk to everyone. Um, now that I've lulled you into thinking I'm done telling you about places to look, I've got two more. And the first is um, OpenVerse, um, which is uh, formerly the Creative Commons search tool. Everything in this search is um, in the public domain or has a Creative Commons license. It's a really great place to look for uh, supplemental materials, especially images, um, because we love to have kind of decorative images in our text, um, but uh, those don't fall under fair use, so you want to make sure that those are openly licensed. You can also find open materials in Google um, using either the advanced search, which is on this next slide. Um, on the advanced search down at the bottom, I'm pointing at it, you can't see me do that. Um, there is a usage rights filter and you can see that this corresponds roughly to the Creative Commons license types. Um, so you can use that filter um, while using the Google advanced search, or you can use um, a filter in the Google image search, um, which is on the next slide where you can see me looking up uh, net phishing, a video, <laughs> a picture that I used earlier. You can click on more um, and you'll get this usage rights filter and you can limit it to images that have a Creative Commons license in their metadata. And that is going to be something you'll want to double check because um, it's not always perfect. Um, yeah, OpenVerse is so great. Yeah, it is great for STEM labs to have examples. Um, you can even go kind of direct to places like 
um, the Smithsonian Institute has a collection of you know over a million images. Um, depending on what you're looking for, there can be individual places. Um, but I still have so much more to cover and like 15 minutes to go. So I'm going to see if I can quickly go through uh, evaluating OER now that you've got a, a huge set of materials you want to uh, evaluate it and you might want to ask me how to do it. And I, I have to admit that I'm re really stumped a lot of times when, when folks ask about this because the answer is the same way that you would evaluate anything for use in your course. Uh, you, you know, you want to make sure it covers the subject area, that is accurate, that is clear, that the accessibility is appropriate. Um, and I really think that OER have a, a leg up on other materials because um, it, it, especially in an adaptation or a, or a remix project, you have the ability to remediate any shortcomings that you find with the materials as part of your adaptation. So if you're finding something that's licensed CC BY and um, you know it could use some some accessibility updates, you can just make those and, and you're helping everyone. Um, so, um, so keep that in mind. Um, and there are a couple of, of resources linked here. Um, the Open Textbook Library Reviews is a really nice framework for um, what to consider um, when you're looking at uh, a whole textbook. And BC Campus also has a great uh, guide for evaluating resources. Um, the slide is from my colleague Abby Elder at Iowa State. Um, yeah, somebody earlier had a question about whether or not um, there's a way to uh, look and know whether materials are um, accessibility compliant. Um, I don't know of a, you know, a handy mark that everyone is using to indicate that their materials are accessible, but we want to make sure our materials are as access accessible and po as possible. And this is when I begin to circle back around to saying planning is key because it's so much easier to start out with accessibility in mind than it is to go back and go over everything. I have a student who works full time um, fixing up uh, uh, OER resources to make them more accessible. Um, so it, it, it takes a lot of work when you can um, bring it in from the start using the built in formatting and style tools in um, in your uh, software, so like in Microsoft Word or or in Google Docs, you want to you know use the title header um, and all of the other built in formatting. You know you don't hit carriage return nine times. You want to use a page break. Um, and knowing how all that works is the key, making sure that you don't um, only provide um, material visually, but um, you're using alt text where where um, appropriate. And you want to build all of your content with visibility in mind. Um, both uh, your text and slides, so making sure that those um, different levels of um, of guidelines are um, based on different materials. So what's good in a text might not strictly apply to a slide deck, which is presented online like we're doing right now, which might be even different than uh, using a slide deck for uh, in-person presentation. And think about font size, color contrast, both for low vision and for colorblind folks in the sciences, especially uh, the colorblind um, can be a, an issue. Um, and uh, remember that your programs like Microsoft Suite, Adobe um, Suite, ha and even your LMS often have accessibility checkers right in them, and you want to take advantage of those. Um, again, uh, your Center for Teaching and Learning is where um, our accessibility experts are on campus. Um, so you've got folks on your campus who are who are um, doing this full time that can help you out. Um, BC campus has a really great guide on creating accessible OER that's linked in your resource packet. And any moment that you spend learning about accessibility is time well spent because it is going to be a skill you'll use uh, throughout your um, professional career. Uh, I also want to mention inclusion. Um, um, and I am going to read the name of this book because it's long. Um, I want to recommend um, Enhancing Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Accessibility in Open Educational Resources um, as something that you can just, you know, link to and, you know, read after dinner tonight. Um, it's uh, by Nikki Anderson, just recently came out, and it's an adaptation and expansion of OpenStax, um, very brief, uh, 
guide to improving representation and diversity in OER materials, and it it is it's very brief read, um, and um, and very useful. So you want to think um, as you're in, include increasing representation. Um, think as you're at every point that you're developing your text. Think about how your team is infusing. Um, representation and, and diversity relevant um, examples and local cultures into your projects. So um, you can think about uh, remixing content to um, have local examples. So one example I use is an adaptation that we've done on our campus was created in California. And so we were able to, <laughs> thank you, Eric, uh, take out the California examples and put in Tennessee examples and immediately our students feel more represented. Um, you can think about doing things like making sure that you use a variety of names in your examples. Um, uh, making sure that you know the scenarios you use in your problem sets and exams represent diverse experiences and really so much more. Um, yeah, uh, and um, oh, we're doing OK on time. Great. Um, just to finally wrap up, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds about textbook production because you're you're just starting out um, and it can get very, very into the weeds very quickly. Um, but I, I do want to give some tips from my own experience and um, the tips on screen from the BC campus self publishing guide. Um, which is a, a great resource as you create materials. Uh, from my experience, the number one thing that you can do to save yourself uh, stress and time is to create a style guide as early as possible um, to help you in uh, how you're formatting materials. Uh, if you don't know um, where to start with that, I think APA style is um, one that provides a good level of guidance for you know how to format headings, subheadings, tables, that kinds of things like um, you know, setting them off from each other. And that that uh, speaks to the first two of these five rules of textbook development, maintaining a consistent structure. So that, um, you know, when a, a student is looking at every page of a book or every page on the uh, learning management system, they know um, after a while they know what's going on and using consistent titles, terminologies. Um, so having a style guide, you know, we're going to call uh, you know, Ryan uh, said open pedagogical practices and I said open pedagogy. So, you know, if we had a style guide, we'd be like, here's what we're going to call open pedagogy and it's not going to be confusing. Um, so having those kinds of meaningful names. Um, and then the, the three additional rules at the bottom about how um, frequently you introduce um, concepts, how you build on concept to to reach new knowledge and how much co new content you uh, introduce at one time really kind of speak to the core benefits of of creating an entire um, cohesive course or textbook, which is that um, presenting material in a manageable and structured fashion um, improves the learning by reducing cognitive load. So that's the that's why you would want to create a textbook instead of just a, a variety of um, of you know photocopies. Um, so again, my tips are you know, planning style guide, carefully note everything. Um, and then final touches, um, a really nice cover looks great and makes you feel good. Um, so make sure you're including everything um, about your text on on the front um, and uh, providing yourself also a nice thorough descript descriptive text that you're going to put in the um, uh, Tennessee Open Education Hub that's going to help folks find your material. Um, like I said, I could go on about all of any particular slide I could go on for another half hour, um, but we have about seven minutes left, so I'm going to um, give it back to Ryan to help us wrap up. All right, thanks Rachel. Uh, I am putting a couple links in the chat, links that we've promised for the entire uh, presentation. So a link to uh, this resource guide that we've mentioned a couple of times, uh, a link to the slides that we use today. Uh, and as you look through these things, um, you will find just a number of linked resources that we hope will help you uh, along your journey. Um, also putting a link to our OER Commons group, the OER development group. 
this is where the recording of this presentation um, and all of these materials will live uh, in the Tennessee Open Education Hub. Uh, it'll take me, well, OER Commons has a, they vet resources as they're uploaded, so it'll take 24 to 48 hours after I post the resources for them to uh, show up, uh, but uh, those will be there this week. Um, if you lose the links that we have. Um, one, a couple, let me let me just get to a couple final uh, reminders and then um, we'll circle back to uh, questions. So as you if you if you have any big picture questions that you want to drop in the chat now, um, we'll try to answer as many of those as we can. Uh, but just a couple of final reminders uh, as you're thinking of your questions uh, that remain. Uh, one, um, uh, the TBR is putting on a conference that, call, that they call We All Rise. It's October 19th and 20th, and it'll be held at the Embassy Suites in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Uh, a thing to know is this year there's an OER track at that conference. And four faculty teams will be presenting on uh, the results of their OER grant project, grant funded projects. So we'll have presentations from TCAT Knoxville, Chattanooga State, ETSU, and MTSU uh, on, on a variety of projects, well, four projects uh, utilizing OER. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to hearing about those. Uh, that's definitely something uh, that you can uh, uh, also partake in. I'm gonna put a link in the chat real quick. Uh, to the conference registration. Uh, uh, yes, um, those are the reminders I have. There was a clarification. Not all the attendees are creating OER textbooks, right? Our grant is for course redevelopment in the LMS. Yeah, so um, if you go to the resource link, um, the final couple, uh, let me actually see if, uh, I don't know that I can do that uh, at this point. Um, my sort of, capacity for tech changes has uh, been exhausted. Uh, but if you go to the resource link, uh, the resource guide link that I just shared in the chat, you'll see there's a variety of, um, we describe a variety of mechanisms for sharing OER. Um, so textbooks and that sort of tech, what Rachel said, called textbook shaped OER is one option. Uh, but that's not the only way of sharing OER. OER includes a whole lot of things as I was talking about at the beginning. Uh, so sharing things inside of the LMS, uh, sharing things that are shorter, that are not textbooks, that are not chapters, that are more like worksheets or more like test banks are completely fine. Uh, that's that's you know definitely possible. Uh, and if that's what you've proposed in the grant, I'm sure that's what you need to create. Uh, what you need to do is just follow those principles of licensing, follow those principles of design, uh, and 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 follow those principles of sharing uh, in the way that makes sense for the product that you're intending to create, right? Uh, back to the point that I made at the beginning, OER is not simply textbooks. Uh, I know it's commonly understood to be textbooks, but that's sort of OER is an umbrella term that refers to all kinds of resource development. Um, good, uh, that's that question. If there are any other questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Uh, yeah, Rachel mentions in the chat, uh, Rachel, you can come on video if you want, but there are entire courses, there are in modules shared. Um, there, there are all, there are all different types of things, um, that that are shared as open educational resources. Uh, right. And one of the, and Rachel, I'll defer to you, but one of the things, right, like again, OER is not textbooks. OER is instructional materials broadly conceived. Yeah, absolutely. And and folks know better um, about their own projects than we do. <laughs> um, but uh, as you're thinking of your project, you can think, you know, what parts of this do we want to share? What parts, you know, can we share? If you're redeveloping within your LMS, you can um, talk with your IT department or or whoever is your LMS manager about being able to export a common cartridge, which is all of the parts of your course that you've developed um, that somebody else can, I could take it and put it in my um, my canvas and then I would see your, the entire thing that you've developed. Um, or you could you know, share individual modules of that um, and there's a lot of different ways to share materials. All right, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Oh, here's one. Um, 
Yeah, there there was another question earlier that I made a note of that is maybe for Elizabeth, um, which was, you know, um, for somebody who said, you know, is there a way that that we can create our material and uh, restrict it from being used from by somebody for, like Course Hero, but maintain an open license? Yes, and I replied to that one in the chat, but that kind of intersects with uh, what Constanza is asking. Um, basically, no, um, no, not really. I would refer people to the chat to get that one, but Constanza, I'm not sure about if there are any requirements for this grant as to how you should license it. Um, some TBR grants that um, I had the pleasure of working with last year had the requirement that everything had to be licensed CC by 4.0. If you really wanted to get, uh, you know, this is back to what I mentioned, if you wanted to put the non-commercial uh, license on it, that's fine. I don't know if you can with this grant. I get where you're coming from. I don't want that to happen either. But again, it does cause issues downstream as other people. It kind of disrupts the ecosystem a little bit. So I would encourage you to just put CC by on as a license, but I'm feeling you on, um, on that concern. Yeah, um, and then Rachel, I had a, such an eloquent response to uh, that answer earlier, so that's why I'm like, look in the chat. Um, basically, the, the short answer is no. Um, you you cannot avoid, but overall, the good things that happen with OER far outweigh your work appearing somewhere else. And then the other point that I added, if it appears there without um, attribution to you, then that's copyright infringement. And you can send them a nice stop letter if you want. How will you likely ever know that it's happening? But the short answer is no. OK, that's the time that we have. Uh, really appreciate your attention for 90 minutes. Um, I know that's a, a long block of time at the end of a day that I assume to be a busy day. Uh, again, please. Please look for the recording on that OER Commons uh, group that I suggested uh, that I put earlier in the chat. I'll put it one more time in the chat if you sort of missed it. Uh, we'll also filter through uh, back through the chat, make sure that we've got answers to all the questions, and those will be posted in that OER Commons group. Um, but good luck with your OER journey. Uh, appreciate you being here today. Appreciate you uh, listening and uh, for all the insightful questions as well. Thanks, y'all.